Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, good morning. My name is Michel Kazachkin, and um, I'm very pleased to co-chair this session this morning with Karen Kaplan. Um, Karen and I both join in welcoming you. Thank you for being um, here early morning. Um, we have a very exciting session uh, and it's about leadership communities. Uh, it's about the very core of the work around harm reduction. And I'm sure we'll hear um, very interesting and stimulating and inspiring communications. Um, we've asked each speaker to stick to something around 12, 13 minutes so that we, after each speaker, we could take a few questions and comments from the audience. Um, and without any uh, further comment, Karen, would you introduce our first speaker? I'd be happy to. Uh, Naro? Oh, Rajiv. Rajiv Kafle, it's a particular honor. He's one of my oldest friends in this movement. Um, Rajiv, with almost 15 years of experience in the field of HIV and drug use from the grassroots level, where it is about saving one life at a time, to the global boardrooms where public health policies and programs are made to stand against corporate greed and broken promises, I have gained a wealth of invaluable insights that can be useful to mitigate the challenges and finding innovative solutions. Alongside a proven track record as a community mobilizer, a committed activist, and a good program manager, Rajiv has successfully established himself at the national, regional, and global levels as an acknowledged leader in the people living with HIV and people who use drugs movements. Rajiv has demonstrated his commitment to improving the quality of lives of people living with HIV and their meaningful involvement at all levels with his pioneering work in <coughs> HIV treatment and care in Nepal and by leading the civil society involvement in policy development, program implementation, and decision making. Presently working on decriminalizing drug use and legalizing cannabis in Nepal by 2020. Welcome. Thank you, Karen. Uh, and uh, thank you, Michelle, uh, and the rest of the panel. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak in this uh, uh, session. Uh, there's been a short uh, change. Uh, I was expecting uh, Elliot uh, Albus to be uh, one of the co-chairs, so uh, I had uh, designed my presentation or written my presentation based on the fact that Elliot would be around. Uh, so uh, it, when I'm referring to Elliot, please uh, uh, take it in that way. Yeah, but I'm happy that Karen is here, and as she said, uh, we have been in this fight for a long time, and, uh, uh, and we have had a very good uh, uh, relationship all, all, all over. So I'll begin my presentation, which I have written in, in the piece of paper, because sometimes I tend to speak too much and, and get all over the place. So that has been my lesson learned in the 15 years. So I said I'd write it, and, and that would, that would uh, send the message clear. So I'll, I'll begin with that. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak in this important event and with you all important people in the lovely city of Kuala Lumpur. Last time I ever spoke in a major session such as this was in KL, was in 1999. Then I was speaking at the closing plenary of the fifth ICAP, the International Congress on AIDS in Asia and Pacific. It was my first AIDS conference and ever first AIDS conference ever after being diagnosed with HIV in 1997. Today, I will share with you my experience of more than 15 years of living with HIV, using drugs, leading a grassroots PLHIV and drug user movement in Nepal, and representing our community in different global forums, being part of the solution by ensuring greater involvement in policy development at national level, running a hospice and a shelter for orphans. Today I will speak of the community perspective, so you might as well have guessed, guessed it right. I do not have a PowerPoint presentation, nor any significant data to make my point. Yet, I hope that I will make my point. This confidence is hugely derived 
from the inspiring words of the biggest leader of our times, Steve Jobs, in his book by Walter Isaacson, where he said, I quote, people who know what they are talking about don't need PowerPoints, unquote. <laughs> Successful advocacy is intended to bring positive changes in the lives of many, and that is what we have been aiming for in the past decades. A major victory for people living with HIV community has resulted from successful advocacy that has led to significant increase in access to life-saving treatment around the world. Many other examples of change in policies are also considered as some of the best examples of successful advocacy at national and local levels. However, a stark reality that we often comfort, uh, confront while discussing in depth about advocacy is the fact that we have invested way too much and achieved very little. For instance, if we sit down and calculate how much we have spent in the past 20 years globally on advocacy-related activities and what we have achieved so far, I'm sure the cost of results that we have achieved could be as high as hundreds of millions of dollars. If we look at it retrospectively, I think we would have never invested on such costly results. So why did we not realize earlier that we are not achieving desired results from our advocacy and redesigned our interventions or made them cost effective? My answer is that we still haven't realized. Let me now jump into something else because uh, I, I I was, uh, I was trying to put the two concepts that I was to pre present together, but I just could not put it together. So, so the next part of, uh, of, of, my, uh, uh, of my presentation is more closer to, the home, closer to home, and it re refers to Elliot, as, as I said earlier. So, what an, uh, so I, I begin, what an incredibly fractured people using drugs movement you have in your country. Read an email to me from my friend and one of our co-chairs today, Elliot Albers, some time back. To an outside world, it looked like communities were fighting with each other, blaming each other for all different reasons, calling names publicly in international and regional forums were some of the reasons for my friend to conclude. I try to explore why our movement is fragmented, why we cannot collaborate and work together. I tried finding answers to why we are so close with so many commonalities than the rest of the world yet so far. Here is what I think what's going on. Firstly, the pie is too small these days. As we all have noticed and are affected by continuous shrinking of funding in the past years, it is not very hard to understand that there is more and more competition, whereas the resources are getting lesser every day. As the saying goes that an empty pot makes a louder noise, I think that's exactly what's happening around us too. As we geared up to rapidly scale up interventions that we knew worked, the global financial crisis hit and the funding started to shrink. Before the financial crisis, I remember the Global Fund Board uh, board meeting, starting with the executive director's report that urged countries not to be shy in asking for resources. It changed so rapidly that in less than a year, the same Global Fund executive director's report would start talking about efficiency gains or cutting the fat. Now the countries are asked to cut everything that are not related to putting pills in the mouth, patient's mouth. I was leading the Nepal CCM, and the first things that were seen as fat was support to community networks. The argument was that it's not community's job to put the pills on the patient's mouth. Fair in a sense, but for those who have been in AIDS movement for a long time, it was a retreat from the global commitment announced by Kofi Annan, a backlash, and the beginning of the end of the global fund. So I'm saying here that it's not only the communities to be blamed for the chaos, it's also part the donors to be blamed. Donors to be blamed for having a very short-sightedness in terms of sustainability of the funding commitment itself. When we had lesser money, not only the fat was removed, in fact, some vital organs got removed too. A case in point is the middle-income countries. That's why I call it the beginning of the end of the Global Fund, as I remember a group of activists from Eastern Europe gathered outside the meeting venue during the Global Fund's retreat in Sofia and handed a memo to the board chair that said, Global Fund is no more global, don't leave us behind. My second point, 
donor dependence and lack of ownership. Though we talked a lot about behavior change interventions for our communities, though we designed excellent interventions to reach out to very hard to reach populations such as drug users, we fail to realize it's a challenge to reach out to the government and almost an impossible task to change their behavior. No matter how hard we tried to please them, it's not worked in most cases. This brings me to my second point as to how the lack of government ownership resulting from failure or lack of interventions designed to change government behaviors has affected the whole community movement. Had governments realized the importance of the communities, they would have supported community networks because we are the ones standing on the front line, we are the ones, we are the boots on the ground. My third point is compartmentalized funding processes. The communities understood very well the intended outcomes of the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness of 2005 and worked towards achieving it. I've talked about ownership, which is one of the pillars of the Paris Declaration earlier. Now I'll talk of the second and the third pillars that are alignment and harmonization. Through alignment of resources and harmonization of interventions and avoiding duplication, we are aiming to achieve a more cohesive response. However, it, it is not easy as said as it is done in the grounds. Everyone has different interests, not to say that standing firm on our group interest is wrong, but sometimes we have to think rationally too. In one hand, we created mechanisms such as the country coordination mechanism that were inclusive of voices from different communities they also became a source of all evil. Not only the CCMs at the national context, but similar mechanisms at the global level had their own share too uh, in giving out a wrong message. A message that said that my interest first, others' interests later, or nothing about us, without us, only us, no one else. Having led the CCM and being part of the Global Fund Board, representing the communities, the developing, country, uh, developing countries and the South and East Asia delegations for nearly a decade, I saw very strange things happening that reflected anything but harmonization and alignment. Hence, I believe that, hence I believe that had we been able to harmonize our effort in true sense, as it was envisioned in the Paris Declaration and Accra Agenda for Action, we would never had to pit one group against the other, one disease against the other. The result, we all gain nothing from this silly fight. So, I would like to bring my presentation to a different tone by asking you all, what if we were to live this all over again? What will you do differently if you are the head of the Global Fund once again, Michelle? I would like to ask what communities would be, do differently, what donors would do differently, and what governments would do differently. Because if we honestly admit our mistakes and start to change them from now onwards, it isn't still too late. AIDS is going to remain with us no matter how hard we try to tell the world that it's ending in a few years from now. It's not. Coming back to my dear friend Elliot, who calls me you bloody Nepali, because of all the trouble he has gone through trying to help set up a grassroots level national network of people using drugs, I'd like to conclude by saying that we are not bad, we are just a bit mad, <laughs> my friend. And this madness has allowed us to survive resiliently in a very adverse and hostile environment. We as drug users are not considered human even till date. We are kidnapped and tortured not only by police but our own people in the name of treatment. We are thrown out of jobs as if we are drug we, we are thrown out of jobs as if we as if our drug using was highly contagious disease as Ebola. Even if we are allowed to be treated at hospitals, doctors tend to wear the Ebola suits before treating our minor abscesses. We are sunned and isolated by our own friends and families because their social identity comes first, the health and well-being of their own supposedly beloved children. So why, why we not be mad and crazy, my friend, why? So that's the end, end of my presentation and I would just like to end with a, with a a different uh, uh, footnote as well uh, 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 on a different thing. Nepal has been going through a very hard time in the past six months, firstly with the earthquake that has uh, devastated a lot of, lot of areas, including Kathmandu, the city I come from, as well as the neighboring cities. And after the earthquake and immediately after the earthquake and 
very recently with the uh, blockade of uh, the Indian blockade, and I really would like to take this forum because we have all been in this fight together, all, everyone as a world, and um, uh, I'd like to like you all to know that uh, there has not been a supply of fuel from Indian side. Nepal is a landlocked country. We don't have access to uh, uh, seaports, and, and uh, uh, we have been deprived of uh, food and uh, fuel for, for the past two months because of uh, some political differences within our governments and normal people like us are being hostage uh, of that and uh, we have been forced to buy, uh, uh, forced to go and look out for firewood to cook food. I run a shelter for orphans as I said earlier and for the past three weeks or more we have been cooking on firewood and that is not acceptable. It, keeping people hostage on some political issues is not fair. So I would hope that this message could be put through through you people and something would change and soon we would have some fuel because we have lost a lot of lives because uh, of the lack of fuel. Uh, ambulances could not bring patients to the hospitals in the center as well. So thank you very much. Thanks for keeping it real, Rajiv, as always. So I'd like to invite uh, the audience to ask questions to Rajiv at this point. If you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand or beckon the people in the orange. Yes, did you have a question? There's a microphone. Sorry, just to um, raise uh, the point that um, he ended with, which is um, what would you do differently um, if you were given the opportunity to start all over again, just on reflection? Any ideas? Me? <laughs> I know it's a bit loaded first thing in the morning, but... I think I would um, go back to the old model of the mm -hmm. Global Fund, yeah. uh, which is, as Rajiv mentioned, a model where we were asking countries not to be shy and come with the expression of their needs. Uh, I'm not sure the a model where the allocation to various countries is decided top down uh, is the right model to go. Uh, that's the World Bank's model. The Global Fund is not a World Bank. The Global Fund is not a development bank. The Global Fund is a fund to fund the fight against AIDS, TB, and malaria. So um, I think that's, that's the thing I would do. But I doubt that I will become the Global Fund's head again. <laughs> 